God be rolled back in the throne. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall be slain. Amen. Amen. I can't wait for that to happen. All right, we'll turn it over to Ben here. He's going to come and preach for the last time. Amen. If you have a New Testament, I'd like you to go to John chapter number 8. I'm going to read to you from Exodus chapter 3, but I want you to be in John 8 so we can get there right after I read this. So in Exodus chapter number 3, the Word of God says in verse 1, while you're turning to John 8, it says in Exodus 3, 1, it says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Oreb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, draw not, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land, unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites now. Therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Lord God, I just pray that you may use me, Lord, during this time, that I may edify the people here, Lord, and that uh, you may be elevated and lifted up. I pray that we may grow from your word, that we may uh, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you for this ministry, Lord. I thank you for the ability to be used of you. And I uh, just thank you for the people faithfully coming, Lord, to, uh, to praise you and lift you up. And we love you, Lord, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Does anybody want to give me a name for the Lord from the Bible? What are a few names of God that you know of? Abba. Abba. That means father in Yahweh, Hebrew. That's good. Yahweh, Yahweh Jehovah, the Lord. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Great. Messiah. Jesus. Brother Ray. Messiah. Yeah, praise the Lord. Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah. So our Lord has many names, right? And one Lord, one God, many names describing who he is. Our Lord, our Savior, our Messiah. I wanted to focus specifically on the name of God that God specifically gave to Moses in Exodus chapter number 3, which is the name I Am. Uh, in the book of Exodus, when the Lord saw the affliction of his people in Egypt and heard their cries and their prayers for deliverance, the angel of God appeared unto Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Now, the bush burned with fire, but it was not consumed. And when Moses went to investigate this bush, God called unto him out of the midst and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here am I. The Lord himself came to deliver his people out of Egypt and the bondage of the children of Israel. 
Look with me again in, I'm sorry, you can just listen. I know you have a New Testament. It says in Exodus 3.10, it says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? So Moses was a man who was pretty insecure about who he was. He had a speech impediment. You know, He probably saw that there were many other people more fit than him to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. But God called Moses specifically. He knew Moses would be the one. Now, later on, we see the continuation of the story. Joshua picks up this uh, intercessory role that Moses had, and he was able to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. But obviously, God used Moses for an incredible work here in liberating the people of Israel and freeing them from bondage. So when Moses asks the Lord what his name is, so he can have an answer to tell his people, the Lord says unto him, I am that I am. Now this was a deep and personal look at the nature of God. I am that I am from everlasting to everlasting. Now in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ uses the same words to describe himself. So what I want to talk with you about today is the I am statements of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we know God is one. The Bible says that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Behold, O Israel, the Lord our God, he is one Lord. Now that word one doesn't necessarily mean one person, but it means a unity. Like uh, this, the same thing with uh, a man leaving his uh, family and cleaving unto his wife, and these two shall be one flesh. That same Hebrew word is used to describe God himself. The three in one, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now, the use of the words I am would have had a very strong significance and connotation to a first century Jewish listener specifically. Because those very words are the words of God himself in Exodus chapter number 3. And much of the work and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't only to seek and to say the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but also all of the lost sheep of other nations. But he also needed to show that he is indeed the Son of God, God in the flesh. Now, there are many people today who deny what is called the deity of Jesus Christ. But if that's the case, then if the Lord Jesus Christ isn't God, we have no forgiveness of sin. We have no victory over death. And we have no victory over hell because only God can forgive sin. And the Lord Jesus Christ was on this earth paying for our sin to forgive us. So to attack the deity of Jesus Christ is to attack the doctrine of salvation. Uh, so only God has the power and the ability to turn hell-bound sinners into heaven-bound children of God. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. I want to look at a few examples of the Lord Jesus Christ being the great I am of the Old Testament. Because I don't know about you, but I believe the same God of the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. Now there was a, a, a heresy back in the early days of Christianity where people saw the God of the Old Testament as a different deity than the God of the New Testament. And the reason they said it is because, oh man, the Old Testament is so brutal and it's so violent. It's just silly. I mean, I believe the most wrathful book in the Bible is Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. So that's a silly argument in general. And the Old Testament is full of passages about the grace of God, the love of God, the nature of God. I mean, if you read the Psalms, it's, it's covered in the love and the mercy and the forgiveness and the grace of God. So this, this ancient heresy really was disingenuous because what they tried to do was say that Jesus Christ had to convince God the Father to do this will, to forgive sinners. Now that's just silly because in John chapter 3 verse 16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that's already, you know, one verse in the Bible completely destroys that thought process. But the I am of the Old Testament is the I am of the New Testament. The same Lord, the same God. And Jesus Christ says, are you there in John chapter 8? John chapter 8? 
Now, this is not technically considered an I am statement. Whoever decided that, I don't know, that's just what it said on the internet. But I believe it's an I am statement. <laughs> and this isn't technically considered an I am statement, but I'll just say it's an honorary mention. That's why I'm going to put it first. And I consider it to be one of the most powerful statements that the Lord Jesus Christ ever spoke. Now, Jesus is talking to Pharisees who were a uh, religious group during this time who were very obedient unto the law, but unfortunately they, they did not know God. They didn't love God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. They didn't love their neighbor as themselves. They kind of had a weird experience with their religion where they were just trying to observe things for the sake of observing them ritualistically. But the Lord Jesus Christ has many altercations with these guys because they're always trying to trick him. They're always trying to convince, or uh, I'm sorry, deceive him and make him say something. But, you know, you can't trick Jesus Christ. I mean, he's the son of God. Amen. And uh, he always had the perfect thing to say unto them. But Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and out of the hardness of their hearts and their pride and the tradition of man, they refused to believe on him as the son of God. But I want you to look with me at John chapter 8, verse number 20. Verse number 20, it says, These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. You'll see that a lot in the Bible where it says, His hour was not yet come. There were many moments where the Lord Jesus Christ could have had his life taken on this earth. But it just shows you the providence of God that there had to be a specific time, a specific place for a specific purpose for the plan of salvation to be able to be given unto us. Amen. He says in verse 21, Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way and ye shall seek me. And look at this, he says, And shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Why can't the Pharisees come? Because they can't humble themselves and receive the gift of eternal life. They're trying to justify themselves in the eyes of God. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he saith, whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, this is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. And verse 24 right here, listen to this. He says, I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that can you say those next three words with me? I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now is that the same I am he as the Old Testament? I think it is because if you go to Isaiah chapter number 43, I'm going to read that for you, Isaiah chapter number 43, we see this I am he talking unto the prophet Isaiah and prophesying against the destruction of wicked nations and also preserving his promises, God preserving his promises in the comfort of who he is. Now, Isaiah chapter 43, it says in verse number 10, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that. You remember those three words we just said together in John chapter 8? I am he. That's Isaiah 43, 10. And understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Well, who is our Lord and who is our Savior? The Lord Jesus Christ. Is that the same Lord Jesus Christ speaking in John chapter 8 as in Isaiah 43? Yes, it is. And he says, I have declared and have saved. Who's our Savior? The Lord Jesus Christ. And I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Now, there's a religion today who claims they get their name, uh, the name of their religion, from this passage of Scripture the blank witnesses. We all know who I'm talking about, right? Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, if the same I am he is speaking in John chapter 8, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is on this earth, and he is rebuking the Pharisees for not believing that he is who he says he is, why would you name your organization 
after that passage, that clearly the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, I am the Lord, and if you do not believe that I am the Lord, ye shall die in your sin, when he's very clearly stating that fact. You are not a witness of the true Jehovah unless your true Jehovah is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And that's just the fact of the matter. Now, this passage makes it clear that without believing that Jesus is that I am He, you will die in your sin. Now, He is the one that saves, forgives, sanctifies, and delivers. Saves, He gives us eternal life. Forgives, He forgives our transgressions. The ones we have done, the ones we are doing, the ones we will do, they're all covered by his blood. Sanctifies means he sets us apart. God has a plan for our lives to set us apart. Salvation doesn't just stop the moment you receive Christ. That's just the beginning, right? That's when you're a baby. A baby has to grow up at a certain point in time. So he's sanctifying us throughout our walk here on this earth. He's trying to conform us to the image of Christ. That's why God gives us the spirit. And God gives us the word so that we can grow and become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And he delivers us, not just from hell, but from this present evil world. Turn to John chapter 6, if you would. We're going to look at the first I am statement. John chapter number 6. Now this is I am statement number 1, where the Lord Jesus Christ says that he is the bread of life. John chapter 6, verse number 30. The word of God says, They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? I always love reading this passage of scripture because it seems like no matter what the Lord Jesus Christ does, people just expect more and more and more and more from him. He can feed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, and then the next day they're like, How do we know that you're really the one? Can you show us another sign? It's like, I don't know, man. I'm just thankful it's Jesus who is the Savior of the world and not me or you, because I'd be like, you know what? I'm done with you guys. I want nothing to do with you. What else can I do? Right? And the Lord Jesus Christ says in verse number 31, I'm sorry, the, uh, the people who he's talking to are saying, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Verse 35 says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now bread sustains us physically. We just had a big barbecue at church. Big barbecue. I ate too much. I shouldn't have ate that. No, I'm just kidding. I tried to keep it light. But I made a bunch of bread and I made a bunch of meat. And I just had one piece of bread. And I'm giving myself a pat on the back for that. Because with me and bread, there's no telling when I'm going to stop. So that bread is used to sustain me physically. That's what gives me energy. That's what makes me be able to go through the day and work and do what I have to do, right? We need those calories and those nutrients. And... More important than that, though, the Lord Jesus Christ is explaining to us that he is able to sustain us spiritually. The children of Israel, they were fed manna from heaven to sustain them when they were in the wilderness. And that manna was supposed to picture God's word, right? Which is why we should wake up every morning and eat the word of God, right? Because the children of Israel had to wake up early in the morning before the sun could go down and start destroying the bread and making it gross, right? Now, I believe that there are spiritual significances to that. I personally wake up early. I do construction, so I have to be up early. And I've noticed the morning is my only time, really, to be with the Lord. That's my only time. And what I love about this passage is that the Lord Jesus Christ himself was someone who got up early and got to be with the Lord. He woke up very early, Probably because he understood, I have a lot of work to do, I have a lot of miracles to fulfill, I have a lot of people to save, this is my time to be alone with my Father, right? But the benefit of reading the scriptures when you first wake up, which is why I recommend it, uh, is that you have a clear mind. It's like when you go through all day, your mind's constantly being polluted by the things of this world. So when you wake up, 
that's probably when your mind is able to be the most clear. And also for me, it's willpower. That's when I have the most willpower to say, okay, let me sit down and read the word of God. Because you know, you get home, you're tired, you gotta eat, you gotta shower, you gotta do all this stuff. But Jesus, as the bread of life, he fulfills not just our spiritual needs, but he fulfills salvation fully. Because without him as the bread of life, we starve. And any belief system without the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior is a system which will lead you to starvation. Now, if your God is the Lord, D-I-M, Jesus says you will never hunger and you will never thirst. And what I believe that is saying, what I believe the word of God is constantly affirming, is that if you receive that bread of life personally, one time in your life, you will never hunger and you will never thirst because the Lord Jesus Christ did all the work for us. Now, he died for every single person, but unless you believe that he is that I am he who died for you and that he shed his blood and he was buried and rose again, then you're still in your sin because the one thing that God requires is faith. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, everyone has a, I guess I can say it this way, everyone has a cute little theory and a experiment as to how we can be saved and become children of God. But at the end of the day, the gospel, the word of God says, is the only way to receive the gift of eternal life. And your faith must be on the only one who can save and deliver you, the Lord Jesus Christ. The only hope of the children of Israel was to be led out of captivity was because of the great I am. Because he chose to make a way for them. Well, the lost are in their own spiritual Egypt today. Now, Egypt throughout the Bible is always a picture of sin. It's a picture of the world. It's a picture of wickedness. And the great I am made a way for the children of Israel to escape that bondage. And the great I am in the New Testament made a way for us through his work on the cross. Yet many people would rather stay in Egypt because they refuse to humble themselves and trust in the Lord. Now we're all in bondage and slaves to sin, but when the great I am delivers, as Jesus said, if the Son shall set you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. Now, I am statement number two. Go to John chapter 8. John chapter number 8 and verse 12. This is I am statement number two. I am the light of the world. Look at what Jesus says in John 8, 12. He says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Following the Lord Jesus Christ pulls you out of darkness and out of this sinful world. And through him, he brings unto us enlightenment in our lives. Now, when Jesus was physically on this earth, he was the light of the world. And now that he's returned to the Father, what did he say we should be? The light of the world. He is required of us to be the light of the world. And in Ephesians, being saved is correlated to being enlightened. Many people think that word enlightened is, a, is like a new age term, right? It's, a, it's part of some weird new age theory. But honestly, I just think that all of this stuff about the New Age is just Satan trying to repackage what God has already done and, and, you know, kind of destroy it and twist it into corrupting people because there is enlightenment found through the Word of God, through the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're trying to tell you you can find enlightenment by, you know, like sitting under a tree and just meditating upon the deep things of life. No, God doesn't want you to sit around and contemplate the meaning of life. He already told you what life is. He told you who life was. The Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, This is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now really, those types of practices still lead you to darkness. It's just covered in a cloak of spirituality. Why I believe the Bible is superior to any other book or religion is that it doesn't leave you wondering. It doesn't leave you wondering your purpose. It doesn't leave you wondering creation. It doesn't leave you wondering salvation, how to live, who to follow. It has all the answers. 
Because it's written by the living God. That's why you can read this at any time in history in the world, and it still applies. It applied 4,000 years ago. It applied 2,000 years ago. If the Lord doesn't tarry, it'll, it'll apply for another 2,000 years here on this earth, or whenever he chooses to come back. Because it's eternal. The word of God is eternal. The Bible says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. Before this book that we hold in our hands, this sacred book, was here in 1611 in the King James Version, before this was on this earth, it was already in heaven. The word of the Lord is forever. It is settled in heaven. Now, many compromising preachers today, I've, I've heard some compromising preachers say that, you know, we shouldn't worry about those who don't have Christ. I literally heard a televangelist preacher say the other day when I was in the hotel. I wasn't watching that stuff, I promise. I was just trying to find basketball. I heard him say we shouldn't worry about those who don't know Christ. They're following the light that they have. That's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that God gave us the light of Jesus Christ. If your light is not Jesus Christ, you are in darkness. There's no way around that. And I thought it was pretty blasphemous of him to say that they're following the light that God gave them. God gave them the light. His name is Jesus Christ. And if they reject the Lord Jesus Christ, that's on them. And I don't believe this junk that, you know, out there in the middle of nowhere, there's no preacher to tell them the word of God. I believe the gospel has been in all parts of this world. And before the Lord comes back, there will be another great push of the word of God being spread throughout all nations. And I have a lot of my friends here, you know, friends that I've, I've known for a long time. And I've noticed a lot of people that are in the world kind of tend to have that thinking. They say, well, what about the guy who never heard of Jesus Christ? And I'm like, well, why are you worried about them when you don't even know the Lord Jesus Christ first? You know, I'm pretty sure Africa has enough missionaries. There's, that's like the first place you think of when you hear the word missionary, right? This is the uh, continent of Africa. But I told him, you know, I'm happy you're thinking about that guy, but how about you think about your own eternity first, right? Now, the true light is the Lord Jesus Christ, if you return to John chapter number 1, because only he has the power and the ability to turn sinners into children of God. John chapter number 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He, speaking of John the Baptist, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light. Can I say that one more time? That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's just showing you that the Lord Jesus Christ is the light. When God said, let there be light, that was the word of God. And the word of God created light here on this earth. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you turn with me to John chapter number 10? John chapter number 10, this is I am statement number 3. I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. John chapter number 10. Verse number 7, it said, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Now the Lord Jesus Christ is the door that all of the sheep enter into to find rest. 
Salvation is a picture of rest. Especially due to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled all the law for us just so that we could rest in his work. Now, he is our shepherd. He protects us. He protects his flock from predators. In this context, false prophets, false messiahs. The only door for you to go through to enter into eternal life is the door of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about Noah's Ark. How many ways was there to be saved during the Great Flood? One way. How many doors was there for you to enter? One door. How many saviors are there today who can take a hell-bound sinner and take them to heaven by his own grace and his own goodness? One. Now the only door for us to enter into is the door of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a recurring theme in these I Am statements that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, the only way of salvation. Notice he says, all that ever came, I'm in verse 8, it says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not fear them. You know, I believe salvation in the Old Testament is the same as salvation in the New Testament. Some things God just chose to reveal progressively, right? But believing on the Lord and him imputing that unto you as righteousness is how people were always saved. It's, it's exactly like when Peter first sees Jesus. And what does Peter do? He knows right away who that is. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You know the voice of the shepherd. If you're saved, if you're born again, child of God. Because the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit that you are a child of God, that you belong to the Lord. Now, it doesn't help if you're ignorant of the Bible, if you're ignorant of the law, if you're ignorant of the Gospels, uh, you know, but ultimately, if you're a child of God, you are saved for all eternity, and God will protect you from damnable heresy. I'm not saying there are Christians who don't believe some wonky stuff. There are. There are. But as for believing that there are many ways of salvation as for thinking this is just one religion of many i don't believe that the spirit of god is telling a child of god that that's not the truth because the spirit bears witness to the truth the word of god who is the lord jesus christ now the lord jesus christ says, all that ever came before me all the false prophets the false saviors the false messiahs they're thieves and robbers false saviors don't give life they take life. They destroy life. They rob people of hope, of salvation, and almost always financially. Think of any false prophet, right? They always end up a lot richer and um, honestly a lot more corrupted than when they first began their ministry or their work. Now Jesus didn't need your money. He didn't need your works. He did all of the work necessary. Everything he did was giving. It was gifted. Notice he, he parallels that with these people that came before him. All of them are thieves and robbers. All they do is take. But all Jesus ever did was give. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And to give his life a ransom for many. Now all these false prophets want money and to lead souls to hell because they're not Sons of God, they're sons of Satan. And false prophets always destroy because the Bible says they're without fruit and they make these people, these lost people, twofold more the child of hell than themselves, just like the Pharisees did in denying the Lord Jesus Christ and trying to convince other people that he was not the Messiah. But Jesus Christ is the I am Lord Jehovah. Last one, I am statement number four, John chapter 10. You're right there. Look at verse 11, if you could. Look at verse 11. It says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep and am known of mine. 
As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. You see how internally consistent the Bible is? Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So Jesus, the Lord, is showing us the difference in him as our good shepherd in comparison to others, right? He is committed to caring and watching over his flock. He contrasts that with what's called the hireling. Now, a hireling is basically just a laborer who's employed for a limited amount of time. I think about it this way. If, if you're a general contractor, you're going to be deeply invested in the outcome of a project. Let's say you're remodeling an entire house because it's your responsibility to make sure that everything is done how it's supposed to be done, that everything is up to code, that all the work is precise, that all the work is clean. And some laborers can be hired for a project as subcontractors, and they could literally care less about the quality of the work that they're doing. Trust me, I've seen it. I've been doing construction for 10 years now. I've seen some guys who just pop in, pop out, and just hope that, they're, that nobody's gonna complain enough for them to get their money. And that's not how Christians should work. Can I just say that? Christians should be the best workers in the workforce. I understand most of you are retired. But nevertheless, you should be a light unto this community. You should be people, a peculiar people, that others say, hey, something about them is different. They follow the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some laborers can be hired for a project and care less about the quality of what they're doing. They just want their money and their part of the job and to get out of there as fast as they can. But... That's contrasted with the fact that Jesus is the good shepherd because he is invested in the life and protection of us, of his sheep. He's willing to protect the sheep from wolves, whereas others would flee for their own lives. And let all of these sheep be slaughtered. But since Jesus Christ is good, he is the good shepherd. He gives his life for the sheep to save us from sin and death and hell. And you know, Jesus is good because Jesus is God. Because no man is good. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the good shepherd, the good master, the good teacher. He's the good God. He is the I am that I am. No man upon the face of this earth since the fall of Adam can say he is a good man. And many people today think that Jesus was a good man or a good prophet. And yes, he was a good man. And he was a good prophet, but he is the good God, the good I am, the good shepherd. Last example I want to show you, Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter number 19. It's in the front of your New Testament. I'll give you a second to get there. It's the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter number 19. This is just an example of the goodness of Jesus, the goodness of the good shepherd. Matthew 19. Verse number 16, this is uh, Jesus and the rich young ruler, okay? It says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, now pay attention to these words, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth of. What lack I yet? This rich young ruler saying, Oh, Jesus, I've already done all that. I'm on my way to heaven. I've fulfilled all of these commandments that you required. What well, lack I yet? What else do I what else do I need to do, you know? I'm on my way to be with the Lord for all eternity. <laughs> but Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, 
and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The Lord Jesus Christ knew exactly what he had to say to convict this young man of his sin. To reprove him of his pride. He said, yeah, you may, you may keep all of these laws, but look, the guy didn't keep all of those laws. Okay? If anybody here could say that they've never bared false witness, okay, I'll acknowledge, I don't, I don't know all of you, but most of you have probably never committed murder or adultery. But I'm sure many of you have stolen. I'm sure many of you have bared false witness, just as I have. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's a pretty hard one. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I don't think there is a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. What it means to do good is to keep the law of God perfectly. None of us can do that. Jesus is the only person to have ever done that. Now this is an often misinterpreted passage by those who would reject the I am, the deity of Christ. And don't be confused. I am is the Lord Jesus Christ confessing his deity, confessing who he is, the son of God, God manifest in the flesh. Now they'll say something like, see, Jesus said there is none good but one, that is God. Well, what I say to that is, amen. So since Jesus Christ is good, and he is the only one on this earth who was ever good since the fall of Adam, and God is one, and God is good, Jesus therefore is who? God. So since Jesus Christ is good, and God is one, he is God in the flesh. I mean, if being the sinless son of God, who created the world, who created heaven, who created you, who created me, in the image of himself, took all of the sin of the world upon himself, healed the sick, gave sight unto the blind, saved souls, gave eternal life, if that isn't good, I have no idea what in the world good even is. Because he is goodness in and of his very being. The rich young ruler had a false understanding of how to receive the gift of eternal life. So Jesus had to first convict him of his inability to save himself before he could hear the words of eternal life. And the Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew, and I believe in Luke as well, he says, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter in the kingdom of God? But he also says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I just want to show you one last verse. You don't have to turn there. I just want to read it for you. It's in 1 Timothy, chapter number 3. 1 Timothy, chapter number 3, where the word of God says in verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who's that talking about? The Lord Jesus Christ. Because no man had seen God the Father at any time. And God is spirit. Right? You can't see the spirit of God. But people saw the Lord Jesus Christ and lived. They saw the face of the Son of God, and he gave them eternal life. It says, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. The I am statements prove Jesus' glory. He is the only way that eternal life comes through him. He is good. He is God. He is eternal. And the word of God says, when Christ, who is our life. Do we love the Lord Jesus Christ so much that if someone says, how would you describe your life, Jesus? That's how much I want to love God and have a burden for the Lord. Everything about my life, I want people to see the light of Christ. Not me. I'm nothing. None of us are anything. We are just created to bring glory unto him. And he is our life if we are saved. Born again, children of God, let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this time. I, I thank you that you are the great God, the great Lord. I thank you for your son. I thank you, Lord, that you are the I am. Without you was not anything made that was made. Thank you for making us, Lord. I, I know you made us for a purpose, to glorify you. And I just thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy toward us. Uh, thank you for blessing us with a lovely day today, Lord. I just pray that we may uh, have a blessed week uh, according to your will, Lord, and that we may grow in our grace and knowledge 
of our Lord. And we love you, Father, and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.